and it must have been up about that angle. Right? In a few minutes. In a few, few minutes, seconds. Just in a few seconds. It just tilted right over. Oh. Right, the, the windows burst in, the water came in. There was mm -hmm. people down the bottom who were trapped. They just had no chance of getting to the top. <laughs> Sometimes when things go wrong involving people, we lay the blame on human nature. Sometimes when the performance of a manned system is not what we expect, we attribute this to human factors. But to blame things on human factors is wrong on two counts. First of all, it doesn't provide any genuine explanation or understanding of the problem. And secondly, Human factors is actually a body of knowledge that helps towards optimum performance of man systems, provided it's used throughout development. Absolutely no pressure to get uh, this particular launch off. We have always maintained that flight safety is our top priority consideration in the program, and we look at the status and readiness of the systems based on that. The Army spends over 50% of its total budget on manpower, so it's not surprising that there should be concern for soldiers at work, such that they can and will do their best. Human factors can help from two directions. There are ways of improving the man or men to achieve military goals, and at the other end, jobs and tasks can be designed and organized such that they're easy to learn and carry out, provide satisfaction, and promote good morale. Before fitting the man to the job, effective recruitment is essential, especially with the current 28% drop in the number of school leavers. What I'll do now is explain to you the recruitment procedure that you're going to go through. Yes. The first thing that you're required to do is the Army written test. The Army is such a large organization that the selection process must run continuously, picking from those that apply those who have the appropriate profile of abilities, interests, and personality for an Army career. All right, Sean, I see that you put down that it's a family tradition to join the forces. What members of your family? Right, sir. Uh, first thing I'll do is take a short of plank from the green pole to the first stump. Then the first man over will take a second plank. The first plank will be removed to allow him to put probably the second plank no. down. Oh. All right, let's, let's have you all back. For most officer candidates, selection involves a complex series of tests of physical and mental ability and a number of interviews at the regular commissions board at Westbury. I rode, sailed and played hockey for college for three years. Which was the most important of all those three? Intellectual, practical and personality aspects of potential are examined using an assessment centre approach. No, we're not talking about what we can or can't achieve. For soldiers, there are over 150 different trades, the obvious ones in the combat arms and many more unusual trades. Okay, the correct answer is D. As the to get the right man for the job, and hence optimum performance, specific abilities, fitness and interests have to be assessed for all these trades, and this is done by a single set of tests. These and the other measures used are scientifically developed and monitored by the Army Personnel Research Establishment at Farnborough to ensure they're valid and reliable predictors of future performance. It's interesting that scores on these two subtests, problems and verbal, consistently correlate much more highly with training scores than these tests. Now, quite a clear picture is emerging, but one of the problems we have is that although the total sample for this study was a respectable 1800 or so, in fact, within each of these... APRE's Manpower Studies Group is also identifying the attitudes or aspects of personality and background of applicants which might determine whether they're more likely to stay or to leave. A questionnaire at selection is a more reliable or repeatable measure than an interview. The loss of one in four recruits in training is a waste of expensive resources, 
and means a lower level of skills. Clearly, it should be countered. One issue which is central to cost-effective training concerns the standard to which men should be trained. These standards should be specified at the outset, together with methods of performance assessment. However, it's often very difficult to observe, record and measure what is happening in terms which are meaningful to the trainee. A skill which is regularly practiced in the field, such as tank gunnery or driving, may not need to be trained to such a high level initially. One is looking for overall savings in training. On the other hand, where there is little opportunity for practice, as with an expensive guided weapon system, it is essential to ensure that the operator gets it right first time. That is, there is single shot transfer of training. The most realistic simulator might impress at first sight, and simulation is often considered as just a substitute for the real thing. In fact, though, it can and should be better, because it can incorporate features especially for instruction and give more practice. Very nearly you're actually on the target. If you squeeze the left hand grip action bar in, you, you notice that you've got the It can represent activities impossible to recreate in the field. An appropriate balance must be achieved between classroom, simulator and live training. Simple, inexpensive devices, specifically designed to train critical parts of the job, are the most cost-effective. However, APRE's design of such devices, which can deviate from reality in several ways, follows a detailed definition of training needs and objectives. Research is underway in a number of different areas to see where cost-effective training can benefit from this kind of simulation. Some of this research employs computerized worlds in which several vehicles can be driven in real time. The equipment enables the researcher to vary experimentally the complexity of the visual image displayed so that the optimum degree of fidelity needed for particular tasks, say driving or target recognition, can be determined. The results obtained will help to establish design principles against which future training simulators can be assessed. As physical fitness is another vital aspect of getting the most from the man, there are tests at selection and regularly thereafter with standards based on the individual's age. As systems grow more complex and move into increasingly challenging or hazardous environments, demands on the humans also grow. An individual's capabilities can be extended by protecting him against these threats, which may be either natural or generated on the battlefield. Clothing, and in particular, protection against nuclear, biological or chemical weapons, has to be constantly improved. Many of these changes or improvements to the men in systems will have impact on the overall structure and function of the systems of which they're part and must be appreciated at an early stage. As rivals each seek to exploit the technological advantage, it is easy to forget that system purposes are human ones. In a man-centered design approach, these goals and requirements can be broken down into tasks. Tasks then allocated to individuals and or machines and jobs designed for people. The man-machine interface is the most familiar part of human factors, and scientific data about man, his size, strength and perceptual skills must be applied directly to the design of equipment. So with the seat in this semi-reclined posture, do you think that... Workspaces can now be designed round people. Instead of squeezing people into spaces left between bits of equipment designed piecemeal. Fine. OK, then we'll reconfigure the rig and try again. Would you move your arms away from your body slightly, please? 
Now stand as still as you can for three seconds. Quicker and much more sophisticated ways of collecting and storing the data are now available. This rapid method of taking anthropometric measurements uses computer analysis of deformations in parallel beams of light. Handbooks and standards now provide data and general recommendations to allow man-centered design of equipment and interfaces. They can also offer general guidelines about the design of the working environment, temperature, lighting and noise. But it's essential to consult an expert to see how these can be properly designed or controlled in army situations, especially inside vehicles. With more than 20 years' experience in this area, the Army Personnel Research Establishment knows well the limits that cannot be exceeded without loss of performance. Extremes of hot and cold obviously impose both health and operational penalties on vehicle detachments, particularly when sustained for long periods. Noise can affect man's system performance, both by its direct effect upon individuals and by disrupting communications between people in groups. Modern techniques for active noise reduction can produce significant improvements in intelligibility. Mission. Clear wood of enemy. Execution. Specific attention during peacetime should be paid to the impulse noise of weapon firings to protect the hearing of gun and missile operators. A growing application of human factors is task design, and here, data books cannot help. But as with conventional ergonomics, mock-ups or prototypes can be used to try out speculative tasks or job aids. This shows new planning aids being developed for the tasking of three subordinate cells. These computer-based mock-ups are often called demonstrators rather than simulators because they model systems not yet finalized. They can be used for research and data collection as well as for design prototyping and checking. They allow a variety of input devices, displays or procedures to be tested to find the optimum solution. OK, I'm just going to set up the next track. Other innovative research can be carried out too. Here, the possible performance of a tow missile gunner engaging helicopters is being measured. Most importantly, a demonstration manned by representative users typically costs less than 1% of a field trial and produces early, more controlled and reliable data directly usable in design or operational analysis. We're going to have to change 843. Combinations of tasks may make jobs for several people. You may have to work as a team, and the organization of teams into hierarchies as well as the size and leadership of working groups are all human factors issues. Jim, got a new fly too. Yep. It's 9255. Five. In dividing tasks between people, many human factors come into play, especially for continuous tasks lasting on the modern battlefield for many hours or even days. But the MC's not quite sure what to do with task three. We sent to him just now. Peak workload or loading over long periods will become significant, as will the effects of extended sleep loss. The air vehicle controller, I think, is not sure where he is at this point. Can you check this navigation point? These are often subtle and may include less visible signs of which the sufferers are unaware, but are nonetheless critical. And how long is that now? It's uh, 60 hours about sleep now. The wider social issues of military life, such as satisfaction with housing, mobility, career prospects and so on, are regularly investigated to aid an understanding of how to improve the whole job and retain the skilled soldier. Clearly, some aspects of system performance can only be assessed with accuracy when the system is in the field. But by then, it's too late and too expensive to make changes to have real impact. Human factors as a set of techniques can help avoid some of the mistakes that can make some systems unworkable. A small investment in that valuable resource at the beginning and throughout system design and operation will be repaid many times over.
APRE is the Army's Human Factors Establishment. Our experience in the physiological, ergonomic and psychological requirements of the soldier is an essential body of knowledge to enable the Army to design, man, operate and assess its systems.